Section 10 of Thoughts on Art and Life. Thoughts on Art, Part 5. Precepts. And thou, O painter, seek to bring about that thy works may attract those who gaze upon them, and arrest them with great admiration and delight, and so that they may not attract and forthwith repel them, as the air does to him who in the night season leaps naked from his bed to gaze upon the cloudy and serene sky, and forthwith is driven back by the cold, and returns to the bed whence he rose. But let thy works be like the air which draws men from their beds in the hot season, and retains them to taste with delight the cool of the summer. And he who will do well by his art will not strive to be more skilful than learned, nor let greed get the better of glory. Seest thou not among human beauties that it is the beautiful faces which stop the passers-by, and not the richness of their ornaments? And this I say to thee, who adornest thy figures with gold and other rich ornaments, seest thou not splendid youthful beauties, who diminish their excellence by the excess and elaboration of their ornaments? Hast thou not seen women of the mountains dressed in rough and poor clothes, richer in beauty than those who are adorned? Make no use of the affected arrangements and headdresses, such as those adopted by loutish maids, who by placing one lock of hair more on one side than the other, credit themselves with having committed a great enormity, and think that the bystanders will forget their own thoughts to talk of them alone, and to blame them. For such persons have always the looking-glass and the comb, and the wind, which ruffles elaborate headdresses, is their worst enemy. In thy heads let the hair sport with the wind thou depictest around youthful countenances, and adorn them gracefully with various turns, and do not as those who plaster their faces with gum, and make the faces seem as if they were of glass. This is a human folly which is always on the increase, and the mariners do not satisfy it who bring Arabic gums from the east, so as to prevent the smoothness of the hair from being ruffled by the wind but they pursue their investigations still further in this direction. I cannot but mention among these precepts a new means of study which, although it may seem trivial and almost ridiculous, is nevertheless extremely useful in arousing the mind to various inventions. It is as follows. When you look at walls modelled with various stains or stones made of diverse substances, if you have to invent some scene, you will discover on them the likeness of various countries, adorned with mountains, rivers, rocks, trees, plains, great valleys, and hills, in diverse arrangement. Again, you may be able to see battles and figures in action, and strange effects of physiognomy and costumes, and infinite objects, which you could reduce to complete and harmonious forms. And the effect produced by these modelled walls is like that of the sound of bells in the vibrating of which you may recognize any name or word you choose to imagine. I have seen blots in the clouds and in mottled walls, which have stimulated me to the invention of various objects, and although the blots themselves were altogether devoid of perfection in any one of their parts, they lacked not perfection in their movement and circumstance. Obtain knowledge first, and then proceed to practice which is born of knowledge. Theory and Practice Knowledge is the captain, and practice the soldiers. The painter who draws by practice, and by the eye, without the guide of reason, is like the mirror, which reflects all the objects which are placed before it, and knows not that they exist. Many will consider they can reasonably blame me by alleging that my proofs are contrary to the authority of many men held in great esteem by their inexperienced judgments. Overlooking the fact that my works are solely and simply the offspring of experience, which is the veritable master. They who are enamored of practice without knowledge are like the mariner who puts to sea in a vessel without rudder or compass, and who navigates without a course. Practice should always be based on sound theory. Perspective is the guide and the portal of theory, and without it nothing can be well done in the art of painting. Course of Study The youth should first learn perspective, and then the measurements of every object. 
he should then copy from some good master to accustom himself to well-drawn forms, then from nature to acquire confirmation of the theories he has learned. Then he should study for a time the works of various masters, and finally attain the habit of putting into practice and producing his art. Mathematics, such as appertain to painting, are necessary to the painter, also the absence of companions who are alien to his studies. His brain must be versatile and susceptible to the variety of objects which it encounters, and free from distracting cares. And if, in the contemplation and definition of one subject, a second subject intervenes, as happens when the mind is filled with an object, in such cases he must decide which of the two objects is the more difficult of definition, and pursue that one until he arrives at perfect clearness of definition, and then turn to the definition of the other and above all things his mind should be like the surface of the mirror, which shows as many colors as there are objects it reflects, and his companions should study in the same manner, and if such cannot be found, he should meditate in solitude with himself, and he will not find more profitable company. Perspective and Mathematics In the study of natural causes and reason, light affords the greatest pleasure to the student. Among the great facts of mathematics, the certainty of demonstration most signally elevates the mind of the student. Perspective must therefore be placed at the head of an all-human study and discipline, in the field of which the radiant line is rendered complex by the methods of demonstration. In it resides the glory of physics as well as of mathematics, and it is adorned with flowers of both these sciences. The laws of those sciences which are capable of extensive analysis I will confine in brief conclusions, and according to the nature of the material I will interweave mathematical demonstrations, at times deducing results from causes, and at times tracing causes by results. I will add to my conclusions, some which are not contained in these, but which can be deduced from them. If the Lord, the Supreme Light, illuminates me, so that I may treat of light. Of the Method of Learning when you will have thoroughly mastered perspective and have learnt by heart the parts and forms of objects, strive when you go about to observe. Note and consider the circumstances and the actions of men as they talk, dispute, laugh, or fight together. And not only the behavior of the men themselves, but that of the bystanders who separate them or look on at these things, and make a note of them, in this way, with slight marks in your little notebook. And you should always carry this notebook with you, and it should be of colored paper, so that what you write may not be rubbed out. But when it is used up, change the old for a new one, since these things should not be rubbed out, but preserved with great care, because such is the infinity of the forms and circumstances of objects, that the memory is incapable of retaining them. Wherefore, keep these sketches as your guides and masters. These rules are only to be used in correcting the figures, since every man makes some mistakes in his first composition, and he who is not aware of them cannot correct them. But thou being conscious of thine errors, wilt correct thy work and amend errors where thou findest them, and take care not to fall into them again. But if thou attemptest to apply these rules in composition, thou wilt never finish anything, and confusion will enter into thy work. Through these rules thou shalt acquire a free and sound judgment, since sound judgment and thorough understanding proceed from reason, arising from sound rules, and sound rules are the offspring of sound experience, the common mother of all the sciences and arts. Hence, if thou bearest in mind the precepts of my rules, thou shalt be able, merely by thy corrected judgment, to judge and recognize any lack of proportion in a work in perspective, in figures, or anything else. Again, of the method of learning. I say that the first thing which should be learnt is the mechanism of the limbs, and when this knowledge has been acquired, their actions should come next, according to the external circumstances of man, and thirdly the composition of subjects, which should be taken from natural actions, made fortuitously according to circumstances, and pay attention to them in the streets and public places and fields, and note them with a brief indication of outlines. That is to say, for a head make an O, 
and for an arm a straight or a bent line, and the same for the legs and body. And when thou returnest home, work out these notes in a complete form. The adversary says that to acquire practice and to do a great deal of work, it is better that the first course of study should be employed in copying diverse compositions done on paper or on walls by various masters, and that thus rapidity of practice and a good method is acquired, to which I reply that this method will be good if it is based on works which are well composed by competent masters. And since such masters are so rare that but few of them are to be found, it is safer to go to nature than to what to its deterioration is imitated from nature, and to fall into bad habits, since he who can go to the fountain does not go to the water vessel. Counsel to the Painter Every bough and every fruit is born above the insertion of its leaf, which serves it as a mother, giving water from the rain and moisture from the dew which falls on it from above in the night, and often it shields them from the heat of the sun's rays. Therefore, O painter, who lackest such rules, be desirous, in order to escape the blame of those who know, of copying every one of thy objects from nature, and despise not study after the manner of those who work for gain. On Anatomy And you who say that it would be better to see practical anatomy than drawings of it, would be right if it were possible to see all the things which are shown in such drawings in a single drawing, in which you, with all your skill, will not see nor obtain knowledge of more than a few veins. And to obtain true and complete knowledge of these veins, I have destroyed more than ten human bodies, destroying all the other limbs and removing down to its minutest particles the whole of the flesh which surrounds these veins, without letting them bleed save for the insensible bleeding of the capillary veins. And as one body does not suffice for so long a time, I had to proceed with several bodies by degrees until I finished by acquiring perfect knowledge, and this I repeated twice to see the differences. And if you have a love for such things, you may be prevented by disgust, and if this does not prevent you, you may be prevented by fear of living at night in company with such corpses, which are cut up and flayed and fearful to see. And if this does not prevent, you may not have a sufficient mastery of drawing for such a demonstration. And if you have the necessary mastery of drawing, it may not be combined with the knowledge of perspective. And if it were, you might lack the power of geometrical demonstration, and the calculation of forces, and of the strength of the muscles, and perhaps you will lack patience and consequently diligence. As to whether these qualities are to be found in me or not, the hundred and twenty books I have composed will pronounce the verdict yes or no. Neither avarice nor negligence, but time has hindered me in these. Farewell. On Study I have myself proved that it is useful when you are in bed in the dark to work with the imagination, summing up the external outlines of the forms previously studied, or of other noteworthy things apprehended by subtle speculation. And this is a laudable practice and useful in impressing objects on the memory. On Judging Pictures We are well aware that faults are more easily recognized in the works of others than in our own, and often in blaming the small faults of others thou wilt ignore great ones in thyself, and to avoid such ignorance see that in the first place thy perspective be sound, then acquire a complete knowledge of the measurements of man, and other animals, and of good architecture, that is to say, as far as the forms of buildings and other objects which are on the earth are concerned, and these are infinite in number. The more of them thou knowest, the more praiseworthy will be thy work, and in cases where thou hast no experience, do not refuse to draw them from nature. Advice to the Painter Certainly while a man is painting, he should not be loath to hear every opinion, since we know well that a man, although he be not a painter, is cognizant of the forms of another man, and will be able to judge them, whether he is humpbacked, or has a shoulder too high or too low, whether he has a large mouth or nose, or other defects. And if we know that men are capable of giving a correct judgment on the works of nature, much more ought we to acknowledge their competence to judge our faults, 
since we know how greatly a man may be deceived in his own work. And if thou art not conscious of this in thyself, study it in others, and thou wilt profit by their faults. Therefore be desirous to bear with patience the opinions of others, and consider and reflect well, whether he who blames has good ground or not to blame thee. And if thou thinkest that he has, amend thy work. And if not, act as though thou hadst not heard him. And if he should be a man thou esteemest, show him by reasoning where his mistake lies. There is a certain generation of painters who, owing to the scantiness of their studies, must needs live up to the beauty of gold and azure, and with supreme folly declare that they will not give good work for poor payment, and that they could do as well as others if they were well paid. Now consider, foolish people. Cannot such men reserve some good work and say, This is costly, this is moderate, and this is cheap work, and show that they have work at every price? End of section 10